Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with another Watchman Pure Bible Study. We're going to be Galatians 4, but I was reading back in Galatians chapter 3. Let's kind of pick up there and let that be the introduction to chapter 4. In Galatians chapter 3, uh, verse 24, we kind of were dealing with that part of it the last time we were here, uh, the law being our schoolmaster. In verse 24 of Galatians chapter 3, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. And remember the law is supposed to be strict and not wavering. I mean, it's the law. It's the rules. You break the rules, there's punishment. The, the schoolmaster idea. Paul got it right. Of course, the Holy Spirit told him what to say. But he's right on that. You don't break the rules. And if you break the rules, there's consequences. So you and I are under those consequences. So that's what drove us to the cross. It was the, the harshness of the law and the penalty under the law, which is death. Romans chapter 1 says that those, that those who uh, commit such things are worthy of death. And there's a list of 23 things there. 23 is the number for death. Look in Genesis 23. deals with Sarah and buying the cave of Machpelah so she can be buried in, in the tomb, all right? So anyway, uh, verse 25, but after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That plays into what we're going to talk about today, that we are the children of God, uh, uh, but after faith has come, verse 25, we are no longer under schoolmaster, for ye are all the children of God, verse 26, by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ uh, have put on Christ. There is neither. And I like this verse. This is what caught my attention here. There's a list here. And every time I see a list, I count that number. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. Six things here. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. The number six, um, it's not always the bad, evil 666 number. After all, there are 66 books uh, in the Bible. Uh, in, the, in Genesis 1, you have the sixth day of creation, God creating beast. But then God creating man on the sixth day. And think about that in relation to what he's saying here. There's Jew nor Greek, neither is neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female. So it has to do with um, the recreation, the new man that is on the inside of us. And that new man literally is neither Jew nor Greek, he's neither bond nor free, he's neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus, all right? So it doesn't matter if you were Jewish or you weren't Jewish. Some say that there, oh, there's a different gospel for the Jews and a different gospel for us Gentiles. That's not what he says here. If we are in Christ, does it matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile? Um, does it matter if you are a bond person or a free person? The book of Philemon was written to... Um, I think Onesimus was his name, uh, concerning a, a servant and a slave that had run away from him. And um, I'm trying to get all this right. I'm just remembering this. Uh, but he's writing to him saying he's a brother now. Okay, He's a Christian. Now, he's still your servant, but you got to remember he's your brother also. And so in that sense, we're all the same and all one. In Christ Jesus, we are, according to this now, the idea is that we are one new man. And that one new man does not have a Gentile side and a Jewish side. Okay, It's all one new man in Christ. Verse 29, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So that brings us up to Galatians 4, because he was talking about in verse 26, you are all children of God. So we're going to look at that concept of a child, and he says in Galatians 4, verse 1, Now I say that the heir, 
as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Uh, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now, I have an illustration, and it's kind of a crude one, but it's really the, the one that I know. Uh, I don't like to just make up stories. I like to tell true stories, or at least what I know about it. Uh, and I know this because I live in the St. Louis area, and the St. Louis area, Anheuser-Busch of Bush Beer, Budweiser and all that, um, was owned for years by the Bush family. It was started by the Bush family back in the 1800s. And, um, and so, and I'm a St. Louis Cardinals fan. I like baseball. And for years, it's not that way anymore, but for years it was owned by the uh, Bush family. Augustus Bush Sr., I think, was the owner of the uh, St. Louis Cardinals and the owner and majority stockholder of Anheuser-Busch Incorporated. He had a son, Gussie Bush, the second, I think, that they called him. But then, and he ran the company after his dad died, but then he had a son growing up under him. And I remember uh, hearing that, you know, as his son was going to grow and eventually take over the company, um, his dad, I think, did it right. He took him and as a young man, probably in his late teens, so on, and he put him in the loading docks. And he said, you're going to work here for a while. And you're not going to be any different than any of these other workers here in the docks. You're going to learn how to work and load all these trucks and take in all this merchandise or whatever. You're going to start down here. And you're going to work there for a while. Then you're going to work over here for a while. Then you're going to work over here for a while. Eventually, you're going to work in the brewery part. You're going to work in the office part. But what he was doing was he was teaching his son the business, the family business. He didn't just take his son and said, son, you're going to be the head honcho one of these days. Just sit back and relax, and one of these days I'll hand you the keys. That'd be the worst thing in the world to do. And I'll make this illustration of any, any family-owned business. I'll get away from the beer business. Any family-owned business where there's a young man or a young lady that's going to be the heir of that business, it's wise and prudent that the father would then take that child and make them go through the family business and actually work it. Work the front counter, work the loading docks, work the mailing room, work here, work there, in order to bring them up so that they are wise enough to know how to run that company because they have worked in that company. They know how this part of the company works because they work there. They have that experience. And I see that here. Because he says in Galatians 4, verse 1, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. And so right now, you and I being the children of God, this is why we still live in this world, and we are part of this world, and we are learning how this world really is. At some point, Christ, at some point, we're going to be lifted up from this world. We are going to be with Christ. When he returns in Revelation 19, we are riding with him on white horses. I, you want to know something? I have never ridden a horse. Not once. I've seen horses. I've petted horses. I've watched my children ride horses. I have never ridden a horse. Don't know what that's like. Don't know the feeling of that, all right? And so anyway, but it's, at some point, we're going to come back. We're going to be riding on white horses, and we are going to be lords with Christ over this earth for a thousand years. Right now, we're learning how to be that Lord. Christ came 
even though he is Lord of all, God sent his son down here to this earth to know what it's like to be human, to know what it's like to feel pain, to know what it's like to be sleepy, to know what it's like to be hungry, to know what it's like to be tired, to know what it's like to grieve over someone who died that was your friend. Christ learned all of that, and he was just one of us, even though he was Lord of all, and he let him crucify him on the cross. The Bible says he tasted death for every man. So we have a mighty captain, we have a Lord that hasn't just been sitting on the throne ruling over everybody. He actually knows what it's like to be one of us, okay? He knows the feeling. So it is with us. We are under the vanity of this world. We are under the rudiments and the elements of this world. We're under all of these things in this world because one of these days we're going to come back and we're going to rule over this world. And we'll never forget what it's like. We'll never forget that we knew hunger, that we knew pain, we knew suffering, we knew depression, we, we knew how to work a day's work, we, we knew the, the agony of losing someone in death, and eventually, if the Lord tarries his coming, we too will know what death is. We will have tasted death. So I think that's what he's teaching here. But it's on the, until the time appointed of the Father. And I want you to think about that. Everything that God does has an appointment time. I just came back, just before I started doing this, I just came back from a doctor's appointment. I have another one in a month. And the time is all written down. They scheduled it. They said, we want you to be here such and such time on such and such date. And I'm obligated to be there. And I probably will be there. They set the appointment time. God has an appointment time for every prayer that you prayed. Everything that you ask God, as a child, he's either going to give it to you, he's going to give you something better than that, even though you may not understand it, you may not know what it is, he's going to do that. But he's going to do it in his time. The Bible talks about the fullness of time when Christ came. There is an appointed time, appointed of the Father, when Christ is going to come again. But it's all about the appointed time. And God knows when everything should happen for us. God knows best of when things should happen. So let that be an encouragement to you if you're praying for things and they haven't happened yet. I'm learning and have learned over the years that God heard the prayer, God's going to answer the prayer, but it's going to be in his appointed time. And I am learning and have learned to trust that. I'm not saying I don't get impatient. But when I am, God reminds me of things like this. Mike, it's at an appointed time. Okay, Can you hold off? Can you wait just a little bit? Because this is how I'm going to do it, and I promise you, you'll love it. You'll enjoy it. And I am learning to understand that now. So anyway, verse 3. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of this world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Again, that, that word, Abba. Every culture, every language has a very, very simplified version of mom and dad. Mama, Dada, Papa, Abba, Dada, okay? All the languages have a very simplified version of that. Why? Because babies cannot say Mississippi. Babies cannot say Susquehanna, Sesquicentennial, okay? Anti-disestablishmentarianism, supercalifragilistic ichthyalidocious. They can't say those words, okay? <laughs> they can only say, ah, ma, 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 ba, ba, da, da. No, no, okay? Dee, do. That's thank you. That's what my 
little grandson's learning how to say thank you when I gave him candy, okay? So that Abba thing is that simplistic form of calling unto God. Don't let anybody steal that away from you. Don't let anybody try to convince you that you must call upon the correct Hebrew form of God. You can't, you can't even say God according to these people. You can't say God. You can't say Lord. You can't say Jesus. You can't say anything. They'll tell you that's pagan. Oh, that's, that's wicked. That's evil. You've got to say Yahuwah or Yahoah or Jehovah or Yahweh or they don't even agree as to how to say it. Don't let anybody steal away from you the spirit of being a son of God, the spirit of God's son in you crying, Abba, Father. It was meant to be simple. God designed it that way. And I, I mean, I'll just say this. I recognize the spirit of God's son in people when they call upon their father in the simplest of terms, God our Father, Lord, Abba, Heavenly Father, they use the simplest of terms, and yet you have these people, seems like they have a different spirit in them, a spirit that makes calling upon God complicated, must say the correct word in the correct way, sometimes even with the correct mindset. That's complicated. I think that that's a different spirit. Okay? So anyway, it's all about the appointed time, and at some point, we will no longer be servants, children. We will be Lord of all with Christ when he returns. All right? So I want to look at this idea of when we were children, all right? That's the setup for the Bible study we're going to do today, all right? Anyway, so let's go and study this idea of being a child. Matthew chapter 13, verse 38. Jesus himself referred to us this way, the field is the world. He's talking about the, the, the parable of the wheat and the tares. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. You see that? Now, let me, let me just kind of pause on this point right here. What is it that designates who is a child of the kingdom of God and a child of the wicked one? There's a Bible answer to that. Some of you who have uh, studied the Bible and you know a little bit about DNA and seed and the word, you would say, well, I would think that a child of the kingdom of God is born again of incorruptible seed. 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed. Corruptible seed brings forth children of the wicked one, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The incorruptible seed, the word of God, the Bible, brings forth children of the kingdom of God. Does it matter? Is it important? What seed, what word, what Bible you associate with or are joined with or have become from? Does it matter? Yes, it does. Because one seed clearly is from the vine of Christ and it is incorruptible seed. It liveth and abideth forever. But then you have the corruptible seed where the seed has been corrupted. It has been, things have been taken out. Things have been added to it. Things have been altered and changed. Just like the words that were spoken by the serpent in Genesis chapter 3, if you look in your King James Bible, you count those words. This, this is why I count things. You count those words. Genesis chapter 3, the exact words that the serpent said to Eve 
in the King James was 46 words exactly. That's how many chromosomes we have where our DNA is stored. And look at what he did. That was the seed, the words that the serpent spoke to Eve, were they incorruptible seed or corruptible seed? They were corruptible because he doubted the word of God, yea, as God said. He altered the word of God by taking out ye shall or by adding the word not ye shall not surely die when god said ye shall surely die then he is he's so he he altered god's word then he added to god's word by saying for god doth know in the day they eat thereof then your eyes shall be open you shall be as gods knowing good and evil his words to eve were corruptible seed what did it bring forth her taking the fruit and eating it, doing exactly what God told her not to do. That's corruptible seed, and it produces the children of the wicked one. Corruptible in that these Bibles are changing all the time. New American Standard Bible, in a certain number of revisions later, they, meaning they've altered the text. The NIV the current version of the NIV now differs significantly from the first version that came out in 1973. How so? They, it's the gender neutral Bible. It is the one where they have neutralized the gender of God and they've replaced, I don't know how many places in the Bible where they, in the original text, the words had gender, they decided to ungender those words so as not to offend anybody. God is no longer masculine. He can be feminine or he can be gender neutral. So they have altered the text of these new Bibles and they continue to alter the text of the new Bibles. That's what makes them corruptible. And people who are born of that DNA, their bodies and what becomes of them is from that DNA. Is the one in the fiery furnace a son of the gods, or is he the son of God? This kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That's in the King James. That's been taken out of these new Bibles. So we are children. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares, the bad seed, are the children of the wicked one. So yes, it does matter. What book is going into your mind and being sown into your heart? It matters. Because all these new Bibles are from a different vine, a different line of manuscripts. A very small line of manuscripts. Vaticanus, uh, Sinaiticus, Alexandrinus. And all of these are corrupted vines. They are the vine of Sodom. And the fruit that they produce is the children of the wicked one. Okay? Now I'm going to move on from that. Matthew 18, 3. Jesus is talking and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And if we take this and go back to Galatians chapter 4, we can see that. God converted us here. So now... We are Lord of all with Christ, but we're still children. So we are still under the rudiments of this world until the time appointed of the Father. All right? So anyway, we expect you be converted and become as little children. You should not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Go to the next chapter, Matthew chapter 19, verse 13. Then um, were there brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them, but Jesus said, suffer, which means allow, allow, suffer the little, suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed thence, he laid his hands on them. By the way, your hand has 27 bones in it. There are 27 books in the New Testament, the New Covenant. He laid his hands on them. New co That's a sign of the New Covenant, people. Oh, I love that stuff, okay? But anyway, the little children of such is the kingdom of heaven, except you become as a little child. 
you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Go to Romans chapter 8, verse 20. Oh, I like this. This is me. This, this is Mike Hoggard, the creature. It's kind of funny because my wife worked with a lady years ago, and she had a little girl about the same age as my girls. And um, her mom tried to tell her that I was the preacher. But what she heard was and what she said was the creature. Okay, I'm not the preacher. I'm the creature. All right. I am the creature. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. I drop things. That's me. Put tools in my hand. I'm going to drop them. My wife gives me things to carry. I'm going to drop one of them. I have my keys in my hand, getting out of the car, going to the front door. More than likely, I'm going to drop those keys. Either from the house to the car, or the car to the house, I'm going to drop them. Okay? I drop things. And sometimes it makes me mad because I keep dropping things. Okay? My hands tend to be clumsy. It's just my nature. It's how I am. It's how God made me. God made me subject to that. And I don't like it. There's one of these days I'm going to be in a perfected state and I'll never drop another thing in my life. Okay? Here, Mike, creature, can you hold on to this? I sure can. I'll hold on to it for all of eternity if you want me to. I'll never drop it. But right now, I drop things. My feet are clumsy. I stumble. I fall. It's who I am. Okay? I have fallen down open stair holes, landing on my back. I have fallen flat on my back, on my bottom. And I'm pretty sure that's what crushed the L5-S1 disc in my back, which I'm dealing with the last few days, dealing with it now. That's me being subject to vanity. I fall, I trip, I drop things, I'm fairly clumsy. I tried basketball in ninth grade because I was six foot one inch tall in ninth grade, and the coach picked me because I was tall. But I was also clumsy with the ball. That's me. I have to deal with this. I have to deal with this body that I have. I forget things fairly easily. That's why I take a lot of notes. Okay? I deal with this. I am subject to the vanity of this world, but it wasn't my idea. God forced me to live. God is going to force you to live in hope. Hope of a better life, a better body, a better world, a better time. But right now, we're under the rudiments and the elements of this world. We're in bondage to vanity. Let's read it. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. So I'm made subject to vanity, dropping things, falling down, hurting myself, getting, you know, all kinds of things happening with me. Why? So that I would be wanting a better world, a better way. God has not made me filthy rich. God has made me subject to uh, a lot of pain and suffering in this world. And I'll take it. I'll take it. My pain and the things that I suffer through is what drives me. It's what compels me. It's what keeps me going. It's because I want a better. I don't want Joel Osteen telling me you can have my best life now. No, Joel, I don't want my best life now. I want my best life. I don't want to eat the dessert before the mashed potatoes and green beans. I'm going to eat the green beans now and the mashed potatoes and the carrots and all the things that people don't like. I'm going to eat them now. And then I'll save the dessert for later. I'll wait and have my best life then when Jesus comes. That's what he's talking about here. Verse 21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, 
but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit. The word, the phrase to wit means wit and wist and wise are all related to one another. They're like brothers or first cousins. It means, I'm going to give you an understanding here. So we are waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope. Well, let me go back to this, the redemption of our body. Because every time I see the word redemption, I think of a coupon. Right? Okay, we get in the car. My wife says, where do you want to go eat? I don't know. Where do you want to go eat? Do you have any coupons? And she goes through her purse. She collects coupons, man gift cards and coupons. What do we have gift cards for? What do we have a coupon for? Well, I got this buy one, get one free steak dinner. By golly, that's where we'll go. Okay. Because we have something, a coupon that says we can have one dinner free when we buy the other one. And that coupon is just waiting to be redeemed. I give them the coupon. They give me the free meal. All right. That's what I think of when I see the redemption of our body. It's in, it, I have a promissory note saying that I'm going to get it, okay? And this one, this one never expires. It's, it's good to, for the, throughout my lifetime. But it's got a promise in here saying that one of these days, I'm going to trade this old body in for a brand new one. Free, I'll take it. And if I have to wait on it, I'll wait on it, okay? To with the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Why would I want my best life now, Joel? Why would I want that? That seems to be, re seems to be against Scripture for these people to tell you. Well, if you just have enough faith, you'd be healed because God wants you free of all your diseases. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. I'll take my diseases. I'll take my pain. I'll take my suffering. Yes, if God, I'm like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, if there be some other way, then, you know, let this cup pass from before me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And the crazy charismatic and word faith people, they can't comprehend that. They've been, t they've been told the lie and believe the lie that you can have all this healing and have this perfectly working body all the time. They got it from Finnis Dake. And Finnis Dake, went around telling everybody that as a Christian, you shouldn't ever die of a disease. We should all die like Moses. Moses had his full life force in him, 120 years old, and then God just took him up and he said, if you're a real born-again Christian, that's how it's going to be with you. Why would you give praise and honor to Satan by having a disease in your body when you could just cast it out in Jesus' name by faith? That's what he said. That's what he told everybody. And then he died. Not with his full life force in him. Oh, no. He died of a disease where it took years to kill him. And there is no cure for it. He died of Parkinson's disease. The one that makes you shake. And the last few months of someone's life dying of Parkinson's disease is in sheer pain. My old preacher, Preacher Goff, bless his heart, went on to glory, but he had Parkinson's disease. He had to get out of the pulpit because of it. Cost him his pulpit time. He loved to preach. In the last few months, the last few weeks of his life, he was so doped up on morphine, he didn't know anybody because of the pain that he was in. That's how Finnis Dake died. Why didn't he have enough faith to deliver his own self from the disease that was killing him? And he knew he had it. He had it for years. Covered it up with medicine so he wouldn't shake all the time. Why, why didn't he deliver himself like he said? Because it doesn't work that way. We're made subject to vanity. All right? 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Turn there. Brethren, ver verse 20, 1 Corinthians 14, 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice 
be ye children. But in understanding, be men. So yes, there is an aspect to salvation here on this earth where we are brought from being children to being adults. Yes, there is that aspect of it. Now, in malice, when it comes to learning how to do bad things, he said, be children. Children are innocent. Children, there's some things that children don't know how to do, right? Most of them. So, in malice, be ye children. But in understanding, be men. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? These people are crazy. <laughs> Look what they're doing. But if all prophesy and there come in one that believeth not or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. How? From prophesying, not from tongues. Verse 26, how is it then, brethren, when you come together, every, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. How many is in this list here? We have a psalm, have a doctrine, have a tongue, a revelation, and an interpretation. I have to think about that one. Let all things be done unto edifying, and if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three, and that by course, and let one interpret. You see, doing it that way is the way that men do it. But all this gibberish nonsense that you hear in these churches, where every, oh, everybody's got a prophecy, everybody's got a tongue, everybody's got this, everybody's, got, and it, everybody's doing all this stuff all at once. Paul said, that's children, that's childish. Grow up. Do it right. Okay? Now watch this. 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to end it with this. I like this. Because, again, there are some things that you just need to grow up to. Understanding. All right? 1 Corinthians 13, 8. Charity never faileth, but when, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. What was the purpose? And why are they going to cease? Or why did they cease? Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. And what he's talking about are these gifts of the Spirit where someone gets a word of knowledge, someone gets a prophetic word from God, God says, thus, say, it's not prophecy is not always just telling the future. I, oh, I'm getting prophecy. Tomorrow, you're going to get hit by a train. It's not, that's not all what pro prophecy is. Like in Ezekiel, send a man prophesy unto them and say. That's what prophecy is, speaking what God said. And he said, whether they be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether they be tongues, they shall cease. What was the purpose of unknown, speaking unknown tongues? It was on the day of Pentecost so that all these people who spoke these other languages could understand what God was saying to them other than just Greek or Hebrew, right? That was the purpose of it. He said, all of these things are going to vanish away. But why? Why would these things vanish away? Look at this. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Think about it. Paul had part of what God wanted him to say. Peter had another part of what God wanted him to say. Matthew had a part. John had a part. Luke had a part. Uh, James had a part. Jude had a part. Some guy named Hebrews <laughs> had a part. Okay, Luke, Mark. They all had a part. You put it together... You have the whole, and it's put together right here in your Bible. Here is John's part. Here is Paul's part. Here is Luke's part. Um, 
Jude's part, James' part, Peter's part. They're all here, all put together as one. Now watch this. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. That which is perfect. This. Now there's other applications to this, right? Right now, I am a part of the body of Christ. You are a part of the, you're a different part of the body of Christ, just like John's revelations were different than Peter's and Paul's, okay? These people over here in Kenya, they're a part. These people over here in Europe, they're a part. These believers that are in South America, they're a part. We even let the Canadians have a part, eh? Right? But one of these days, we're all going to be joined together as one. That which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. We'll no longer be down here all fragmented and separated from one another because we don't all agree on the same thing. And we're not supposed to. We can't because we all have a little part here. And I don't see everything that you see and you don't see everything that I see. But it does make us brethren and it does make us equal. And there are people that I would disagree with on certain areas, but I think they're my friends and I want them to be my friends and I want to be friends with them. And I want to, I don't think that I should have to agree with everything they say in order to be that kind of friend and brother. But right now we're all in part. But one of these days, that which is perfect is going to come. Then that which is in part shall be done away with. We'll not all of us join together one of these days in that perfect body, we're not going to disagree anymore. Isn't it beautiful? And so it is with all, all this era of the early church where before the codex of the Bible, before it was all brought together, you had Paul prophesying in part, Peter prophesying in part, John prophesying in part. But then that was done away with. You had those guys speaking in tongues unknown to them, the speaker, but known to the hearers. But see, now we don't need that anymore because we have it all right here in our tongue, perfectly translated for us. When that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. You see that? Watch this. Verse 11, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child. I thought as a child, when I was a child, I spake as a child, understood as a child, I thought as a child. Three. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass, darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Right now, I asked God years ago, when, as he was just pouring things into me some 16, 17 years ago, 18 years ago. And I, in my enthusiasm and zeal, I said, God, give it all to me. Show me everything in the Bible. What a fool. I'm not going to know everything in this Bible. I'm not going to understand it all. I can, my brain can only hold so much. I can only understand little pieces of it, but you can understand a different piece of it. And you over here can understand a different, and you guys over here can understand a part of it. But one of these days, we're all going to know everything. We're going to know even as we are known. Isn't it great? Right now, as far as some things, we are children. But when that which is perfect has come, all of this childishness that we do right now, it's going to be done away with. Isn't that exciting? Okay. And I love, I love this. this. This is beautiful. So we get back to Galatians. Okay. In Galatians chapter 4, there's parts here. Think about it. The things that you know now, you didn't know maybe five years ago, right? The things that you now understand, you understand and you know and now realize maybe now that before you were saved, you were dead wrong on some things. Living a wrong way, believing a wrong way, practicing things that weren't right, doing things that weren't right. 
Now that you know these things, here's the question, and we're going to get into this as we move through chapter 4. Why would you go back to what you used to be? Why would any of us adults want to go back and be children again? We can't, number one. But he's going to teach in here in chapter 4. Now that you've been made free from the elements of this world, why would you go back to them? And you're going to, some people are going to get maybe bruised by what I'm going to say. Why go back to observing times on Yahweh's calendar? Why go back to the Hebrew roots? Why go back to Mount Sinai? Why? We were made free from that. Why go back to it? Okay? So that's where we're going next time. All right? Oh, I've had a good time with this. This is good. This is a good lesson. All right? I hope you benefited from it. And take this that, that I've shown you here and just go through the Bible and see it in new and better ways that I could never see. All right? Hope it's a blessing to you. And it's a blessing to me. You're a blessing to me. And you're the reason why we do what we do. All right? God bless you. I love you. Pray for you. You pray for us. Support us if you can. Pray for us always, all right, that we can keep doing what God has called us to do. We love you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.